What's up everybody? Welcome back to the Bond Armory. I'm Ray Crumpled and today is a very special video. Today we're going to be reviewing the 2020 Walther PPK. I'm not going to be doing it alone. My good friend Caleb Daniels from commando.bond.007 is going to join me as a co-host. But that's not the only big surprise. We actually have Cody Osborne from Walther Arms USA that's going to be answering all of our questions and giving us all the information on the PPK and he's going to join us in a live chat through Zoom. This is going to be a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it. Walther well, PPK at 9mm short. As of a random killing machine or a person escaped. Walther, that was cute to get me one of these. Thanks for having us on. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, very excited to be on, man. So, um, Cody, uh, I know that you, when we spoke, uh, you said that you were a Bond fan as well. Uh, what, what's your favorite movie? Tell us a little bit about you, your, you know, how you got into Bond, that kind of deal. Yeah, man, it's a, it's a pretty crazy story. Like, when I got into guns and, and stuff, I was a Bond fan before that. And I really didn't know much of the a Walther PPK, I, I knew of it, you know, but didn't have a whole lot of experience around it. Um, but I will say, you know, Pierce Brosnan got me into it. Um, I'm 31, so that was kind of my era Bond guy. Then, you know, Daniel Craig's been, been pretty awesome here recently, but uh, really a big fan of the old Sean Connery films. Um, you know, Dr. No, I think is still my favorite uh, by far. Good choice, good choice. Uh, yeah, yeah, best Bond girl, too. It's hard to beat that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, kind of throughout that, I've always just been a real big fan. I mean, even at my wedding, I wore Midnight Blue with Black Shawl, Tuxedo, um, you know, carried a PPKS for, for a long time until I kind of really started figuring out more modern guns and, and getting into the more competitive shooting side of it. Um, but it's always kind of played uh, a big role you know, in my life and in the firearms industry too. And, um, like I said, a big fan even before I came to work for Walter. So once I got in here, it was, uh, kind of a fit like a glove, you know, I've still got collect all the bond, uh, cars that I have hanging up there at my desk and got the, the Royal Dalton bulldog from the movie back here and some history books on bond and 007 here in the office. So, uh, it's a, it's a pretty important part to Walther, and I've always kind of told people I don't I don't know if Walther gets through the the low times without you know Bonds Hill. Um, it is such a, a huge part of the pop culture scene, and you don't really tie firearms or firearms companies into a pop culture scene. But Walther is very much mentioned in a lot of different movies, and especially of course the Bond movies. So um, yeah, it's been a been a fun time and i always make everybody around the office watch all the bond movies so it's my uh 50th anniversary dvd set has been passed around through the office quite a bit and uh, so you get everybody up to date very cool very cool yeah uh, how about you Caleb? oh yeah i mean so in terms of the firearm side of things um, i mentioned a little bit on my channel but i've worked at uh, frontier justice over in the kansas city metropolitan area for five years now um, I got hired on a month after we opened. That's, um, of course, how we got that PPK to you. My friend Kyle uh, got hired on just a few months after me. He's now our uh, buying manager, purchasing agent. Absolutely phenomenal gentleman, Mr. Feist is. And um, been really awesome in the shop. Um, always my favorite day when the Walther rep comes around, for sure, because, you know, I've been a Bond nerd since I was probably 10. So, you know, being able to engage with the community and really being able to blend both things that I'm really passionate about, firearms, self-defense, et cetera, and then the bond aspect to it, whether it's just talking about Walther as a brand, whether it's the CCP, the PPSM2, whatever it may be, really helping discern people to some quality firearms, Walther's always an easy choice. So it's really awesome to be here today, for sure. I really agree more. I push Walther all the time at Free State, too. It's my <laughs> favorite company. You can't beat German engineering on a firearm, that's for sure. I want to talk about the, the history of the PPK. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Fill us in. Bit and feel free. Like I said, I'm not a not a history expert when it comes to Walther because we've got so so much of it, it's hard to keep up with it. But uh, it, it was a pretty interesting thing to, to see the PPK kind of back in the day and, and when you start reading about Carl Walther's star and then his son Fritz Walther, who was really the, the mastermind behind the PPK, right? When 
you had a lot of guns. You had that kind of craze for for pistols coming out over here in the U.S. with uh, John Browning and the locking block style gun. Um, and Fritz was just super fascinated with semi-automatic pistols. Kept telling his dad, hounding his dad that, hey, man, this is this is the future. We, we have to make one of these. And uh, finally convinces him. They, they make up some prints to a new gun called the Model 1, Walter. Germans are really innovative on names very creative right. <laughs> um, so uh so the model one comes out and it was the first ever fixed barrel semi-automatic pistol um and that's what really propelled it if you look at the ppk you know whenever it came out and, and still to this day it's a fixed barrel semi-automatic based around the original patent that fritz and Carter walter had on that um, so they went through a lot of renditions of that model series, uh, you know, model one, two, three, four, five. That's a very collectible item all the way I think, up to about nine or so. Um, they came out with the Walther PP, which was a, a little longer barrel version of the PPK, basically. Uh, took off, very successful, but they had a lot of uh, interest in making a shorter barrel one, uh, which was the PPK, the Police Pistol Criminal. Um, and it was really designed and made for kind of undercover agents, basically. Um, so something that was very easily concealable, but very high performance at the same time. And if you look at what the what the PPK was back then, it was basically a collection of a lot of different technologies all shoved into one pistol. And they actually created a lot of trends with that pistol, too. If you look at it, it was the first double action, single action pistol ever made. Um, so that means whenever you pull the trigger, it pulls the hammer back and then lets go, you know, fires around, or you could pull the hammer back, lock it back and then fire it in a very, in a single action mode with a very light trigger pull. And what was really innovative about it was the rotating safety. Also, this was invented by Walter. Uh, you rotate the safety down, it decocks the gun and puts it on safe. No one had ever seen anything like that at the time, especially uh, law enforcement and uh, military. You looked at something that was, very, very safe to carry, but very high performance at the same time. And uh, it, it really revolutionized everything. And uh, it, you kind of fast forward throughout time, and it, it just keeps popping up throughout history. Uh, you, you look through World War II, and it's, you know, it's it's fame there with all the, the different German officers and things like that. Uh, you start looking at, you know, just its police use throughout time, and then you get into, you know, the Bond movies. And, and that's where it started to really take off. And it's still to this day, like I'll just, I'll be watching Netflix and see, you know, a PPK come across. I'll watch Narcos Mexico, uh, you know, during this whole time. And they specifically call out the, you know, these, you know, cartel guys carrying, you know, Chrome PPKs. And, right. you know, so it's just, it's nonstop. And it's always kind of been seen as this very iconic kind of gentleman style gun. And I always tell people there's there's very few guns in history that you can just take a black silhouette of them and be able to identify them and know what they are. And most of the time, they're not really tied to a specific brand. You look at the 1911 or, or AR-15 or, or something like that. It's not a very specific brand because there's a lot of people that make it. You take the Walther PPK and people say the brand. It's a Walther. It's PPK, right? There's, there's no one else that does it. And it's one of the most recognizable guns out there. So uh yeah like i said it's it's history is, is really cool especially when you start looking back at how innovative that gun was and to withstand the time of nearly 100 years and like i said we're still back ordered on that product it's it's absurd to think about yeah yeah it was what 1929 it was uh it was developed here we are in uh 2020 so another nine years or so we're looking at yeah. 100 years yep yep so you're it was right around that time frame, which is always a little weird because it was like PP and then PPK came out. And uh, so, and there's been a lot of different renditions through time. But yeah, that, that era of that whole PP, PPK um, series, like I said, is nearly creeping up on 100 years old. Yeah, it's got to be exciting around the office. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, especially a new Bond movie coming out too, like, we already can't make enough of them, so uh, we're, we're trying <laughs> as hard as we can to up production and preparation. But uh, yeah, it's uh, going well, though. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, yeah. You're gonna say something? yeah, yeah. In terms of like the history and stuff, I think one of the most impressive things I, I know you guys are talking about a lot with your marketing and your branding really is the fact that it was like 
the iconic and the first proper concealed carry pistol. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the spread during the late 20s really was your baby Brownings and the 25 auto, and then mm-hmm. you got a clear full size five inch barrel. And there wasn't really much in between, if any. And so I was, it, it's really cool, you know, knowing the history of the gun and talking about the, the features and things of that nature that not only did it pioneer so much for the industry, but it also pioneered a whole demographic and a whole concept for us in terms of safe carrying pistols and premium optimum calibers for self-defense. And I always think it's funny, especially I know they did like a small run in 25 auto, I believe as well, like very, mm-hmm. very beginning. Uh, but I really love the fact that similar to bond, we transitioned away from a 25 to something a lot more powerful retrospectively to a 765 to now a 380. And it's a caliber that still stands up to this day. So, you know, it's an awesome firearm and I'm really, really excited for it for sure. I love, can't wait to see what 2029 brings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And as a, yeah, some of the advertising we did around it of the kind of, we invented concealed carry aspect of it. And that that's what the play was. And we definitely understand that, yeah, there were pocket pistols out there and stuff, but you look at like what people are starting to carry nowadays in modern times. I mean, what I carry every day is a, you know, a PBQ with a compensator and a red dot on it every day, you know, and I, I like to take all that performance that's available to me and put it into my carry gun. And that's exactly what the PBK was and nothing like that existed back then. It was, it was very bland, you know, and I think the, that's what made the PBK so famous is it was very revolutionary, it was sexy, it was, you know, it was cool to have one, you know, and uh, I, I kind of compare that to a lot of these, uh, these guns, you see what, what people are carrying around today, like I said, with comps and weapon lights and all this different technology added into it, where some of your other people will kind of look at that and be like, eh, you know, it's not, not for me, but uh, you have that crowd and that's what makes things last a long time. You know, you know, you don't last a hundred years by being the same as everybody else. So, yeah, it's true. Um, one one of the most common questions I get asked is like, if if you were going to rearm Bond with a different gun, what would it be? And it, there is nothing like a PPK. The PPK is just elegant. The lines on it, it mm-hmm. but there's no other gun that looks like that. Everything is squared off in military um, yeah. or you know, law enforcement. There's nothing. Bond is a elegant gentleman spy. It's the perfect gun. There's nothing modern that looks anything like it except for yeah, the new PPK. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's it is withstanding the test of time. And yes, there are, you know, we get into this question all the time. Like what, what, a, what would Bond carry nowadays? And we've got, you know, this new steel frame series. It's very sexy. And, and uh, but you know, for, for what Bond is, is this, this undercover agent, and, you know, like I, the PBK still fits him perfect, you know. And I, I think if he needed to kind of go John Wick on somebody or something like that, you know, maybe like crack out the you know the Q5 steel frame or something like that. But uh, but I think for what it is and what the movie is, it's uh, that gun just matches him perfect. Very good, very good. Um, how about we actually take a look at the PPK, the new 2020? Mm-hmm. So when this box actually showed up at the range, people were asking me why I got a watch sent there. Um, just the <laughs> box itself, it's perfect. I mean, it, that's what it looks like. It looks like uh, you know a Rolex or an Omega came in it. And there's the case. Now, I, don't be one of those people that opens the gift and then reads the card. Like, go here first. Little, little anticipation happened with the box. Uh, we've got the Walther branded cable lock. Always important. Firearm safety. Okay, we have our uh, warranty. The ever important instruction manual with all your warnings, operation procedures. All right. There's your little uh, NRA. There we go. <laughs> Definitely join. And of course, youth handgun safety. Always important mm-hmm. if you have kids. And now we get into it. Now, what made you guys go with that? Like such an elegant box? Like that's a presentation box. Is it because there was that yeah. hiatus and you wanted to do something special? Yeah, it drove me crazy, man. When I looked at some of the old packaging and it came in this like plain plastic box and a you know like a plastic bag on the inside, I was like, this is not <laughs> this is not what the PPK is. It's a very elegant gun, and I think it deserved a case to to show that off a little bit. And so we 
we kind of teamed up and, and worked with Negrini cases, which make very high end cases. If you look at them, they're, they're quite expensive too. No, oh, just for the record, it comes with one finger extension and one flush mag. I just had a spare heel with me that I threw on there. Oh, the coat, yeah, the one, one flush and one pink. pink okay. But, uh, yeah, we were excited to get that, that, that good feeling. When you open it up, it should feel like a high-end gun. Right? You're, you're paying quite a bit of money, paying $800, $850 for these guns. Um, it, it should feel like it. Yeah, and it definitely has that Skyfall-esque feel to it, right? Mm, when you get that yeah. box, that right size, it has the gorgeous cutouts, and that blue plush, just kind of velvet-crushed look is just exceptional, and it really does fit either the stainless or blue finish just exceptionally. Yeah, like I said, I was, I was really excited to have that. And that was kind of the purpose of the cardboard box with it, so I could put all the paperwork in there and, and just leave the feeling of when you open that case up, it's the gun. You know, you don't have all these instruction booklets falling all out over you. And, uh, you know, so I think it, uh, it, it plays good and, and just matches the gun really well. So instead of going with a bluing, um, this is in the black melanite finish, and it's also available in stainless yep. steel. Uh, yep. Can you tell us about the black melanite? Yeah, no, that's something that was, you know, we went through a lot of different meetings and back and forth on what to do with that black one because uh, – it's tough. You can't change anything about that gun. If, if you did, people would probably protest in front of the building out here if we changed anything on that, on that gun. So, um, but when we were talking about it and what the gun is, you know, we still want people to be able to carry this and use it. It is still a very functional and high performance gun. And when you look at what people think of the PPKS as a kind of a secret agent man, you know, 007 style gun, the flat black really just plays into that. It, it's, it is a flat black, uh, but it's not, mm. it's not a dry flat black, if that makes no. sense. Um, yeah. like it does have that kind of like, not a gloss to it, but it's not like you know, a can of spray paint type flat, flat black. Yeah, you're not on like a exactly. by any means. You're still able to catch the light. It still has all that, but I really, I agree with that point. You know, it definitely has that more uh, secret agent appeal, right? Where it does, mm. You know, the, the sheen's really low, which means ideally I'm assuming that it like long-term holster wear or like exposure, it, it's meant to be just strong and protecting and allows the gun to have that utilitarian purpose as well mm -hmm. as being just that iconic platform. Yeah, because bluing is very corrosive, right? It's a corrosive finish. Um, it it's, doesn't hold up very well to the sweat and daily carry. It rusts. Um, and so when we look at it from a, from a performance aspect, yes, it's very nice looking, but when we go with this black melanite finish, uh, it's actually a little higher end finish, uh, in my opinion. And two, you can carry it every day and it's not going to rust. It's, you know, it doesn't get corroded by salts or anything like that. And so really it's going to last you a lot longer. It's going to hold up to holster wear a little better. Uh, it's just a better finish all around. And melanite is something that's actually produced, um, as far as the finish, it's not like a paint, like it's not a Cerakote or something like that. It's, it's an actual like process on onto the metal itself. Right? Yeah, it's a QPQ process, so it's basically like a type of. I don't want to get if there's engineers out there, they'll probably ring me. But like a, you know, it's <laughs> basically like a type of dye of metal. You know, you're actually changing the composition of the metals there. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a much harder process. We use you know on some of our other lineups from you know from our old Germany plan as a tenifer finish, which is a very extremely hard finish and gives it that nice black finish too. Um, but since these are made here in the United States, we went with the, uh, the black melanite. Yeah, let's see. So, uh, and I noticed that uh, too, um, the field strips are exactly the same as yeah. the pre-war, post-war, the Smiths, and now uh, the modern. And there, there's really not a lot of differences uh, between them. Uh, one thing I was talking to Caleb about, sorry, I'm great. one thing I was talking to Caleb about, uh, when I did the initial unboxing, some of the first things I noticed uh, as far as uh, the differences um it's kind of like an amalgamation of a pre-war a post-war and then the smiths like there's little aspects of each one mm -hmm. um like the uh that little curve up at the uh the slide that leads into the frame uh, i forgot what they call that that little pattern there to reduce uh, yeah, the wave texturing yep uh yeah that's a little different um the post-war has actually had uh adjustable rear sights this one is mm -hmm. fixed like a like a pre-war uh what else you have the uh the dovetail is uh, still extended a little bit. Now, it could just be the finish. I don't know if it's just me. Is it 
the same as the uh, the Smith designed ones, a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. Uh, so that that beaver tail is the the same length as the Smith era, um, and that was something that if you've ever shot a you know pre Smith era PPK, you, you probably still got the, <laughs> the scars on you a little bit there. <laughs> um, so just from a customer satisfaction standpoint, we had to we had to leave that in there. And I think anybody that legitimately shoots them appreciates it. <laughs> you know, right? Uh, my little brother still rocks the uh, the short beaver tail version. Uh, and every now and then he'll text me a picture. He's like, damn it, man, I got my hand up too high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Caleb actually has one of the pre-wars uh, with him as an example, too. It's a work in nice. progress doing a restoration. Yeah, she needs a lot of love. I just bought the spring kits. <laughs> nice. That's cool. Let's see. Uh, some of the other things I noticed on the new 2020, the rear sight, uh, the fixed sight, uh, mm -hmm. is a squared aperture. Um, well, the, I'm not sure, Caleb, you can correct me, the rear sight on the uh, pre-war, was that the U-shape? Yeah, so that was, that one's a rear, kind of a U-shape, it's more about like, almost like a, maybe like a 15 degree, kind of 30 degree mm. cut to it, and then the Smith, of course, has that same square aperture, and it kind of is more that rigid, similar to what you currently have with the 2020 as well. Yeah, and when we looked at the sides, we wanted to kind of give a better combination of the two because if you look at like the Smith era, it was more of a like a pinned in style sight. Um, we wanted to go back to the fixed uh, iron sight version and have it all machined in there. Um, that way it kind of matches the lines a little better and stuff. But um, we still kind of wanted to add the, the easier kind of side acquisition and stuff like that with the square notch on it. So, um, and, and that's what this gun is kind of meant to be. It's the first time it's been back in Walther's hands to, to manufacture in a while um and we're you know all of us love it you know and uh we wanted to kind of bring it back to that kind of original quality of what people really thought of the ppk very good very good and uh caleb uh, caleb pointed out to me too the lanyard uh, you guys decided to get rid of that little guy yeah yeah uh i don't think any of us are, are riding horses shooting guns anymore um but uh <laughs> yeah. for yourself man <laughs> yeah right I, I still laugh at uh of grip safeties on on guns that come out nowadays because that was why they existed was for riding horses and, and, uh, so i don't understand those but uh still out there <laughs> right some things still got carried uh, right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so if we if we go back uh like uh, caleb said there was 25 caliber 32 380 um uh, 22 uh, why why stick with the 380 just uh, for the defensive round purposes yeah it's a more effective defensive round and really with a fixed barrel semi-automatic that's about as big as you're going to be able to get and comfortably shoot um, we get that question quite a bit because on the side of the side says nine millimeter Kurtz <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh this is nine millimeter no so then I have to go through the entire process you know like yeah, right. this is Kurtz which means short and 380, right. you know, like uh, I've went through that many times over the last five years. Um, but yeah, when you start getting into that, if you look at our CCP lineup, it's fixed barrel, semi automatic, nine millimeter. Um, but we had to add a gas piston system in there that it operates on just to reduce the recoil down um, where it's, it's nice and manageable. Um, and two, nowadays, just 380 ammo is, is a lot more plentiful than 32. We still get some requests for them. Uh, for the 32 caliber and we, we have kicked around the idea and stuff and and talked with some of the other ammo companies and stuff but you know everything's gotta gotta make the money too you know and and that's where it's at the 32 caliber is just not a very popular defensive caliber out there nowadays um where the 380 is still a pretty legitimate choice um, to go with very good very good speaking of uh i actually had a chance to shoot it during lockdown um, so I, I did notice uh, shooting it. Um, I, I used to own a, a 1968 um, PPK in 380, mm -hmm. and uh, that one seemed to have more recoil to it. It was a little snappier, kind of like uh, how people compare like 40 and 9 millimeter. Um, mm -hmm. Going from 32 to that 380, it just kind of popped in my hand a lot. The 2020 doesn't mm -hmm. do that. Um, were there any? Was it a different material? Um, I use all different types of ammo. Uh, I just happen to notice it, it, it stays on target. You get down quicker. It's a mm -hmm. lot more accurate. Um, is there like an engineer uh, engineering side? Does anything change? 
was available for them to test with and, and create the gun around. And ammo, I've compared to, to like cell phone. It, you know, it not that long ago, the, the razor compared to where we're at now with phones. Ammo is light years ahead of that even um, and, and what they're getting out of ballistics and things like that. So, um, so nowadays we're getting a lot more power out of, out of our ammo, getting better consistency and accuracy out of them. So too, when we go to develop a gun um, in the BBK, because it was an old war gun, um, we had to basically re-engineer it here in the U.S. to be able to manufacture it here. Um, so when we start going through that and testing all the different 380 caliber ammo out there, um, we're actually able to make that gun around most modern day ammo. So we can kind of control the, you know, the recoil springs and uh, the chamber pressures and support and everything like that a little better when it compares to modern day ammunition. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I did like the addition of the uh, the colored sights compared to um, the uh, the sixty six model. A lot yeah. easier to require the target. It pops right up with really good lighting. Also on the recoil, Ray, I really do think that um, that extended beaver tail probably does a lot of work for you as well, since you can kind of get a little higher up on that gun. You have a little more to work against there, whereas that shorter one probably does give you a little less to choke in onto. Because um, I've noticed that um, just on the Smith, even with the with that longer, you know, beaver tail, I get a lot of people complaining about the snappiness of the cartridge. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, when, when you shoot it in that with that longer beaver tail, you really do get that. I mean, it took all my willpower not to shoot the one we sent to Ray before we sent it to Ray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beaver tails help. You know, when you look at a lot of our high performance, you know, competition guns and stuff like that, there's beaver tails on them for a reason. You know, yeah. <laughs> they help you go a little faster. Time. That's no joke there. Yeah, that's like holy beaver tail Batman, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, it does uh, it does help when you get out on on range but but uh, yeah last year we did april fool's day joke and did a cad design of a pbks that had a yes. trichicon rmr and an x300 weapon light on it and the thing thing went nearly viral you know actually and, i think yeah. I, I think i reposted that as well yeah. actually yeah, really posted it. people send me photos of it all the time asking about if it's real yeah i was like oh my god you know <laughs> So, uh, maybe one day, but... <laughs> well, I mean, that is one of the questions. We opened our uh, our Instagram channels up to quick Q&As with people to ask on the interview. One of them definitely was, I think I got one or two about, is there ever going to be an RMR or an optional optic? And slide's a little thin for that. Um, yeah. Right. A uh, hundred years ago, nobody thought to put a red dot side on a pistol. So, <laughs> no. that's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely... Uh, hurt the the lines of the ppk for sure you have to square nose it pretty aggressively to make that a reality yeah exactly so uh it was a, it was a funny project we got, got a lot of laughs out of it though so oh for sure <laughs> well caleb since you mentioned it uh do you want to open it up to the uh the online questions yeah definitely i mean I, we, we answered actually a lot of them uh a lot of the big stuff you know like you said cody the big question a lot of people have for walter and i'm sure we we get it a lot as well um is you know, more functional or new mm -hmm. firearms for 007. We already covered mm -hmm. that, definitely. I would agree, you know, to extend upon that um, a little bit more. We've seen him carry steel frame full sizes as a backup sidearm, an additional sidearm. It was like a 226 in the past few. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I about flipped the table when I saw you guys were doing the uh, PBQ with the four-inch barrel. Because I'm like, mm -hmm. that's the one right there. I mean, if you're talking about, yeah. like, two mid-sized bond sidearm that fits all the bills striker fired like the p99 it's a full steel frame and it's that proper length yep. so fingers crossed we see that one in the holster sooner than later for sure yeah i hope so too uh that, that's what my idea of that god would be it was just just perfection if you look at some of our new like meister manufacturer series of the q5 and the q4 steel frames we got some really cool kind of stainless looking models and high polished blacks and stuff like that so i think there's a lot of opportunity he's rejoining there we go oh yeah, there we go out. yeah i get kicked <laughs> out man <laughs> kicked out. let's see yeah let's see here we go oh there we go there you are yeah, back so where it cut me off at but <laughs> i mean we lost you about you know I, I really do like the um like i think one that caught my eye like immediately at one of you guys first posts on those customs was like the tuxedo that mm. was like high polished matted with the stainless kind of showing through. Yeah. 
doing a lot of amazing work with those. And I'd love to see those kind of transition into the bond world as well. Yeah, I think we're already starting to see, like, if you see the Q5 match, it's popped up at Deadpool 2. Yeah, um, we yeah. just got, uh, we just saw the new movie poster for the new Ryan Reynolds movie where he's, uh, he's like a character uh, inside of a video game and doesn't know it. And there's a Q5 yeah. match on the, on the cover of that. So I was like, man, like, we don't do anything with that. If they call, we'd probably help them out. <laughs> but, um, you know, but it's just, you know, when the guns look right and they perform right, like, people want to use them. You know, and uh, so I think it's got a good potential uh, to start making its appearances in there. So, very cool. Uh, let's see. Um, Scott Lavare on Facebook said, asked, uh, I keep hearing how the new Walther PPK is a unicorn gun. Uh, with such strong demand, what adjustments to supply is Walther make? Uh, <laughs> time to <laughs> hire more people. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy thing. So, like I said, we had to basically re-engineer the gun to develop it here. And we got U.S. facilities in about 2012. And it started off as literally just two people running the sales and marketing department for Walther USA. Um, and so then we had to build up the entire team, right? A, a full sales team, a full marketing team, a full Walther manufacturing team with engineers and, and all of that. And so that's what we've spent the last, like, five years doing. And, uh, you know, last year we, we launched the PPKS finally, which uh, there was a lot of hurdles to go over be because of a, it was a German war gun, you know, um, and just engineering it from scratch. Um, so every day we're producing more and more and we're, we're putting in new, new efficiencies to get uh, more and more developed every day. So, I mean, we went from producing just, you know, in the beginning, just 20s and 30s a day to now over 100 a day. So um, we're headed in the right direction and there's a lot of room to grow, too. And until we know, it's like every one we make is sold already. Um, so it's a it's a good incentive for us to make them, you know. Uh, so it, it, it's an important part of our business. And we, we keep wanting to invest more and more into the manufacturing side of it as, as Walther grows here in the U.S. market. Very good. Let's see, uh, Golden Devereaux on Instagram, compared to the PPKS, which would you choose for concealed carry? I'm a very performance-driven concealed carry guy and shooter. Um, I said every day I carry a, a PPQ four-inch model. Um, I think, you know, 15 plus one capacity, uh, probably the best striker fire trigger on the market, very accurate. Um, it's a gun I've shot in competition at a national standard. Um, and it's the same gun I carry every day. It's, it's some versatility there. Um, so that's what I've always carried. Sometimes it's a little big, big of a gun for some people. I carry appendix. Um, so it allows me to, to carry a little bigger gun with a little bit more efficiency. So, um, but if you look at like modern day single stack guns, like the PPKS, um, the, the PPS was something I really found myself leaning towards. Um, I carried a PPKS every day for years. Um, loved it. But when you get out and start, really pushing your boundaries on what you can do from a concealed carry standpoint on draw times and, and split times between shots and distance and all that stuff. Um, some of your modern guns like, you know, PPQ subcompact or the, or the PPS are, are going to excel um, just because they're, they got a lot of new modern technologies uh, based inside of them. So, um, but yeah, me personally, PPQ four inch, most versatile gun on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sexy looking gun too, no doubt. Absolutely gorgeous. And, it, you know, it spawned from the P99, you know, which was yeah. Oh, yeah. on the gun there. I was, I was still a huge fan of the P99. Um, I have a couple of I them. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I did a video on it, and I, I even said in there, like, you, if you look at any other brand, nothing comes stock that shoots that well. Like, uh, SIG yeah. has the SRT, the short reset trigger. Yeah. The Walther P99, <laughs> the first gen Walther P99 was even shorter oh, yeah. than that, lighter than that, more accurate yeah. than that. It's fantastic. Yeah, that gun was just that gun was about 10 years ahead of its time yeah. you know, like of a double action single action just like the pvk but striker fired <laughs> that usually right. blows people's minds and I, I worked retail in a gun store for a while too and i would try to explain to them that you were decocking it but you couldn't physically see the hammer like decock and so they just it was you know? <laughs> so it was a really cool gun i, I love it um but like i said nowadays i, I kind of tend to to veer towards that PDQ trigger just because it's single action only every shot. 
and it's still safe to carry. So, and that's where, you know, the P99 AS model, you know, you had a lot of people that departments that were like, yeah, I like double action, single action, but I want a safe way to carry it in single action. Same way like 1911 people, right? They'd love to carry like, you know, cocked and locked, but they still got that safety on um, in that single action mode. So we were able to give, you know, customers something that no one else could with a safe action style, single action only. So cool going though. Absolutely. Let's see, we have uh, Tyler One Hickman on Instagram. Do you recommend the PPK for EDC, everyday care? I do, actually. I think it's still a very, very proficient uh, concealed carry gun. I think it hides better than most. Um, and I think it's it's double action, single action is still still really good. Now, you, with any double action, single action gun, you got to practice that first shot, you know, because mm-hmm. you're going to have that heavy trigger pull coming out of the mm-hmm. holster. Um, and that's where, where some people are going to struggle with. Um, but from a safety standpoint, from a performance standpoint, that gun will do everything a modern gun will. It's just you have to adapt yourself and practice a little bit with a double action, single action trigger. So, um, yeah, I think it's a – and like I said, we make these modern guns, these new finishes and all that to carry. We don't we don't want them sitting in a safe their whole life. That's a, that's a shame, man. So we want them to get out and get shot. So. <laughs> right, right. Well, let's see. Underscore C Wild on Instagram. Uh, how do the roll marks on the slide compare to older PPKs? Now, look at them. I don't think these are roll marks on the new 2020 PPK, are they? No, they're engraved now. But uh, yeah, it's always going to be based around what importer there is. So, you know, on your side there, you're going to have Walt Arms Inc., Fort Smith, Arkansas on the side because, you know, we're the manufacturer um, of the gun. But the on the other side of the gun, that's going to, it's going to be very close to what the originals were. The, I mean, we still, like I said, put the 9 millimeter Kurtz slash 3D ACP on the side, which is incredibly confusing for, for new gun buyers when they look at the side of it. But just to keep that kind of look and that feel of the BBK, we, we leave a lot of that stuff on there. So, yeah, And uh, compared to the two, um, the older ones, I mean, it, it does have its age, but like the, mm. the roll marks on it, they're not as defined. I mean, this this pops and it looks fantastic on there. It's nice and deep. Yeah. I mean, most, most it, guns it nowadays. Yeah. Most, most manufacturers nowadays will, will use a laser, just a laser that stuff on now. Um, but we kind of chose, like I said, to, to bring the quality into it and do a full engraving, um, on the side of that. So that's, that kind of gives it its, its pop. And when we start putting coatings and doing stuff like that, that all those marks still show through really well. Awesome. And the last one I have uh, was from Jay Beeland. Are the metal edges on the grip sharp on the new PPKs? Um, this is something that me and Caleb actually talked about with yeah. the Smiths. The Smiths, the edges were kind of angled and sharp. Um, when mm-hmm. you go back, they're much more smooth and kind of rolled. Uh, it has that like uh, melted look like uh, 1911 people do where they kind of you know, smooth that out. Mm-hmm. The, new, the new 2020s, it's not sharp. But it still has that kind of edge to it. It kind of gives it more of like a more modern look. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, uh, what was the decision behind that, as opposed to giving you know, the real smooth edges and stuff, go with that kind of squared off kind of look to it? Yeah, on the slide, it's all about like the a lot of the aesthetics and things like that, but to machining efficiencies um, also, and to make sure everything kind of is still efficient to manufacture. On the frame, we normally got. Uh, if you look at like the Smith area compared to the older ones, they were like chamfered on the edge the, mm-hmm. um, around the frame. So it was really smooth on your grip. Uh, and the Smith ones got really sharp. Um, so we went back and we actually chamfered the frame edges all the way around. So that way it kind of blends in a little better and it's a little easier to grip and doesn't, you know, have those sharp edges on it. But on the slide, it was basically, you know, machining efficiencies and aesthetics. Gotcha, gotcha. And Caleb, you had some people uh, message you questions as well, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, we've answered quite a few of them. I had a couple of people asking about, like, reliability of the PPK. Obviously, mm-hmm. we discussed, you know, in terms of, like, functionality over 100 years. This is still a platform that's exceeding expectations of doing what it can very well. Um, you have your your Hollywood-style questions, the reliability, mm-hmm. like, the true-to-life Q Branch Media asks... Um, how true to life is the suppressor utilized in the films? Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's tough on the that fixed barrel to do, you know, suppressor ready 
380 fixed barrel, but uh, it's it's funny to see those uh, kind of throughout the movies. But 380 can actually get pretty dang quiet. Um, some of the, the, the suppressors from Jim Tech and, and things like that, they're these like pill bottle sized uh, cans can run on oh. these 380s and stuff like that, especially to the PPKS 22 is always a fun one to, to put a can on. Um, mm-hmm. That one's really easy to and very, very quiet. So you can kind of play 007 there a little better. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah, I mean, I some, you guys, was it in 2015? You guys did the, it was, it was that little nod to Bond. You did the with Silencer Co. with the Spectre. Yeah, the Spectre, yeah. yeah. Right around that, Spectre drop. I mean, that was, that, that was perfect branding right there. I love that. Awesome. And, and I think I can't remember. I think they made 250 or 500 of those, if I'm not mistaken. And I think they said they sold out in less than a day oh, yeah. on that. And, and going through the process of buying a suppressor and all of that, like still, like those things sold out that quick. So that was a cool, it's a cool find. <laughs> Absolutely. Is that something that we might possibly see in the future with uh, the, the new PPK? Is uh, a threaded barrel? Yeah, like I said, there, we, we've got a lot of stuff in the books. Uh, to explore on that gun. So I'll, I'll definitely keep you guys on the first loop on, on new PPK stuff. Um, whenever we start to announce those things out, but, um, we, you know, like I said, we are making more and more a day. So it's going to give us a little bit more room to start exploring these, uh, special makeups, these PPKs. And, uh, we got a lot of, uh, legit shooters here at the office. So our, our minds go quite wild. <laughs> Let's see. I think one of my favorite questions, it's um, from a friend of ours at that one bond guy. Uh, Chris asks, um, is it pretty practical to actually carry it with a suit? <laughs> ah, so surprisingly, yes. Like yeah. I think some of the Galco leather options, like they make, uh, if you look at the Pierce Brosman era, that yeah, I've got the executive. Yep, got that one. Yeah, man, <laughs> dude, it looks great. And I sported mine uh, with my blue tuxedo. So <laughs> it, uh, it's actually a legitimate option. Uh, just, you know, be cautious of who you flag when you draw from a, from a shoulder rig, but um, still works pretty well. That's why I like the uh, Daniel Craig era holsters. He just carries the simple kind of inside the waistband leather holster. Um, I think DeSantis or somebody makes for them, but. Uh, uh, Vega. Vega. Yeah, the Vega. Vega, yeah. Yeah. I, think, I thought that was a more kind of legitimate option, but uh, yeah, I think. Uh, does look good. That's when I actually want to carry my PPKs when I dress nice. So. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like you said, it's that, it's just the feeling you get when you handle a firearm. It ha- it carries so much of a different connotation to it. And I guess in terms of like the suiting as well, I, I really do think like Daniel Craig transitioning to that suede, you mm-hmm. know, when he carries it, he carries with a single vent in the back. So the gun doesn't get exposed when he's bending over or interacting, yeah. engaging. So, I mean, no matter how you carry, whether it's an incredibly well-fitted suit like Inspector or more looser fit mm-hmm. like John Connery era, you can carry it however you like. It's a very functional firearm for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like to like when you get back a that feeling of it, like putting it on with your suit and dressing nice. I I have my workhorse pistol right, and I have my workhorse watch too. You know, you're not gonna wear your Omega or rolex every day as a edc watch you know especially when i'm out shooting but when i dress nice it's a, it's a good feeling to put on a nice watch the nice gun um even though nobody could see it man it makes you feel good so yeah, you, you know when you put that jacket on you have like the bomb theme just playing in your head oh yeah for right? sure man it's actually my uh, yeah. ringtone on my phone so usually yeah. when people call me they hear it <laughs> it's a voice roll in there <laughs> No, I feel like you always have that uh, that Casino Royale moment when you put that holster on and you start fitting the jacket and you're looking for the print to see if it exists <laughs> yeah. or whatever. You really have that fitting of the bow tie moment where you're like, yeah, no, it's the lines aren't there. Let's, let's rock and roll. We're here for it. <laughs> for sure, man. <laughs> uh, any other uh, questions from uh, online? Yeah, I'm skimming to see what we haven't really talked about. I guess one of the things that I really like to ask, because we talked about the history a little bit, but um, uh, Keith Packerin, I apologize for that last name if that's not correct, uh, asked about like, is it likely or of uh, like operatives, whether it's my six or otherwise, had ever actually carried the PPK like throughout history or even today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that was why it was made back then, and I still, to this day, I have guys come up to me and they're like, "Man, I carried a PPKS as my backup gun to my, you know, my duty gun every day for you know, twenty years." and the amount that I hear that at all the shows and when I go out uh, and work, it's, it's, it's crazy. So 
still to this day, it's a very viable option. And I think you see it more. I think back then you saw it more as a primary. Um, and I think today, nowadays, with a lot of your undercover guys and, and police officers, you're going to see it as a secondary, more as a backup gun. Mm -hmm. um, the way duty guns are made, you know, now are, you know, 15, 17 rounds of nine millimeter. Um, but they still like to have sometimes, a lot of times on the ankle, um, as their ankle carry gun. It's kind of their backup. And the PDK is the one that they like. And whenever they, they take that duty belt off and they're just walking around, you know, as a, as a normal Moral person, it's usually the PBKS I talk about uh, that they're carrying every day. So it's still a very viable option. It's cool to hear, too. Uh, I love to hear that stuff. Oh, for sure. And it's like, you know, when we were talking about the history side of things, you, you had your, your baby pocket pistols and then your, your full size. I think Walther's really one of you guys are one of the only brands that really produces a proper CCW size 380 anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, ev everything's, I always call it like an M80 in the hand. You just kind of frame yeah. and pull the trigger doesn't yeah. bark too terribly much. So, I mean, yeah, what are your options for a backup? You have something that will snap like crazy and has the same magazine capacity, or you have something that's a little bit bigger, has a steel frame, and you can have follow-up shots that work all day long. Yep, exactly. It's all about performance. You know, and I've always told people that I'm a, I'm a diehard about trying to – I'm constantly working on my, my draw time and speed and, and what I can do. and those pocket pistols just don't hold up after a while. They're great for what they're made to do, right? Put in your pocket. Um, but when it comes down to legitimately using them, uh, it's, it's tough to make them tough to make them hold up for you. Um, especially when you get on the range, and you're trying to practice with them. Um, usually people like to shoot about 10 rounds and they're done shooting them, you know, PBK, PBKS, man, you can get out on the range, have fun all day, burn through your entire paychecks worth of ammo and uh, <laughs> still, Absolutely. still want some more. So, <laughs> Um, I actually got a question from uh, our buddy Donnie at Quantum of History. Um, I can't tell if he's busting my balls with this question or not. Uh, he said, with, with the constant fight with Congress over gun laws, are there any new technologies being in introduced on the horizon to both appease Congress and add measures without changing the operability and classicness of your handguns? Oh, and I think this plays into a lot of effect what you see coming out of California with the, the micro stamping and stuff like that. Um, from this standpoint, though, um, where we abide by everything on a, on a national standard, on a, on a state standard, too. So, um, but you know, we are constantly trying to abide by a lot of the, the different rules when they when they play fair. Um, you look at uh, New York and, and some of those other states with 10 round capacity laws and stuff like that. And we definitely go out of our way to make you know, uh, specific mags just so we can ship into that state you know, specific uh, trigger weights that will match other states and uh, there's melting point laws and, you know, different states where they have to be certain materials that hold up certain heats. And, and so we do, yeah, abide by a lot of that stuff. Uh, when it comes into the fact of California, we get the P22 in there and that's it. We physically can't get anything else into that, that state um, because of the laws that they've put in place. So, uh, just nothing we can do from that standpoint. Technology doesn't exist. Um, but w we see it more as, you know, kind of coming together as a, as a firearm industry to make sure we're, we're doing the right things. And we see really well. Uh, you're always going to see all the negative stuff pop up. There's a lot of positive uh, ground that's moving um, a lot through the state, especially with constitutional carry and what you're seeing from a manufacturer standpoint. There's not many, not many industries where you see the rest of the world moving to the U S to manufacture. Um, and you look at what's happened over the last five years here for the, the firearms industry is you've had six hour move to the U S and become one of the biggest you know, players in the game. You've had Walther move to the U S and build facilities. Glock come out over from Austria to build facilities. H K has now U S facilities. Um, everybody's moving here to start manufacturing and, and create jobs and, and create the, you know, the, the safety and the, the education of, of what we need from a firearms industry. So it's really cool to see. And yeah, like I said, we, we do like to abide and, and make sure we work with all the States when, when they play by the rules too. So. Gotcha. Yeah. I think I maybe get one to three questions a week about California and oh, yeah. <laughs> man, there's, I, I will say like, you know, California, we have one model that goes into that state. You know, there's a few different uh, variants of like color variants. We can do different mm -hmm. colors. But that state is still one of the top states we sell to overall in sales. 
And you look at it from a standpoint, we get to ship one model there. <laughs> it's it's crazy. crazy. So, yeah, and a lot of potential. There's a lot of gun buyers out there, and there's a lot of people that are, are pro Second Amendment and they're for, you know, carrying firearms and owning firearms and stuff like that, but they're just outweighed a little bit by the other side. Um, but there's a very dense population out there that, uh, that supports firearms. So uh, I, I try not to be the guy that, you know, just the bash on California all the time. It's hard not to sometimes, but uh, there are a ton of people that are very supportive and a lot of good companies. And you look at Surefire, you know, that make some of the best suppressors and flashlights and, and things for our military and police out on the market. And they're, they're in California, you know, so and there's a lot of good companies out there too that are still firearms based. And uh, so we try to do what we can to still push the, push the, the right, uh, the right cause. So. Very good. Uh, yeah. Um, the, another question I got, uh, this is from, uh, Ray Crumpold. He has a, a YouTube channel called the bond armory. Um, <laughs> He noticed one thing was missing when he uh, did his unboxing. Oh. Where's my Wal Where's my Walter sticker? Oh yeah. <laughs> why Why have I never gotten a sticker in a Walter uh, handgun that I purchased? I spent too much on the box. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. No, Perfect answer. no I, I will say yeah. That is, I keep like a in my truck and backpack and everywhere I go, man, I carry like decals with me. Cause that is like what people want. I think we do need to do a better job of putting that in the box. We did that with the steel frame. Like when you buy a steel frame, you get the SF sticker, um, in the box. But I think in the future, you'll start to see it's more of the, uh, kind of swag in the box and, and, uh, ways to support Walter. So. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah, I know one of the things Ray and I both have, only because one of my guys, Kyle, again, awesome guy, went to SHOT Show and snagged a couple of those challenge coins, those 2020 challenge Oh, nice. Coins. Yeah. Dang. And I sent one along to him because he got me a duplicate. And, that, I mean, that, that that's a daily carry in the backpack, always there, because that's Walter Swag you can have right there for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. We do uh, very limited amounts of challenge coins. So I don't think we've made a challenge coin since then either, uh, but we are kind of playing around with some new ones. So, yeah. All, All right. right, Caleb, you want to uh, you want to do the wish list? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, what we had talked about, you know, Ray and I talked in advance, kind of like what things would be really neat to see long term, mm -hmm. and I think we kind of talked about it very briefly, like in um, newer models or what have you. Obviously, you guys said production is what it is right now. You're really just grinding out and getting them onto the market. I mean, we're shipping them wherever you can to get them. We mm -hmm. just got in a 2020 steel frame PPKS, which is awesome. Um, this, pardon me, steel finish, that's stainless steel. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the second one I've seen since we opened, uh, since you guys opened sales. But one of the things we were talking about was, you know, similar to what you guys did with the um, Silencer Co. branding, doing like mm -hmm. a almost return to form, to, whether it's in a 32, 380, what have you, with like the lanyard or things of that nature. You know, you have like, these iconic profiles on the nose right there. That's like that pre-war mm -hmm. Bondian style, uh, things like that. These, these really, whether it's a 32 threaded, you know, whatever it may be, would be an incredible addition. And be cool. Lord knows every Bond fan that follows both of our channels would eat your production alive. That's awesome. Yeah. That is a, that is something we've kind of kicked around as like the kind of classic style icons and, uh, restoring a lot of that, uh, a different style and throughout the years of just all the other models too that we that we've got that are pretty famous too so i think that's uh that fits right in line of uh some good ideas you know, <laughs> that we can kind of present could that be possibly something for the 100th anniversary of the ppk are there any plans cool. that gives that? me a good idea uh honestly uh I kind of live by the seat of my pants here and work on about a one year out schedule. <laughs> and um, so, uh, but no, I think that is a, uh, a very cool idea that I'm actually going to write on the board up here and uh, kind of start going through a little bit. That's a, that's a pretty cool deal. Um, and yeah, hundred, that hundredth anniversary on PPK is very much creeping up on me. So. <laughs> like you said, year to year, but I mean, the past few months might've gone by slow, but Lord knows once things kick back into gear, it'll start flying yeah. Yeah, we we we've really used just these last uh, this last couple months. Just just we have a lot of new products coming out, and uh, just to organize the the launches on all that. And and uh, like I said, I, I feel like it's already twenty twenty one for me. Uh, that's I think about all Q four and and uh, you know shot show and all 
all that stuff. And uh, so my years go by pretty fast around here when you start thinking in terms like that. <laughs> I forget sometimes it's only April. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Think about sure. I think I've aged five years in the past two months. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> well, speaking of, uh, you know, the craziness that's going on and everything, uh, Walter has a challenge you know, and uh, a couple different kits that you can buy to occupy your time while you're in quarantine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did uh, the CQT challenge, uh, which was the uh, Corona quarantine challenge. <laughs> and, uh, we uh, opened up a list of uh, airsoft guns that we have that actually fit in the same holsters and um, and uh, kind of give you the same feel as our nine uh, millimeter and center fire versions of guns, but airsoft BBs. So you can practice on your you know draw to first shot transitions and, and things like that. And we we created a little target and a challenge to move around to let people you know if you're, you're bored sitting at the house uh, gives you something to do get some trigger time in there. Um, pretty sure your neighbors probably wouldn't wouldn't appreciate it if you were uh using nine mil in the house so (laughs) we give you some some airsoft versions and then uh and yesterday uh we actually launched a a heroes vip program so anybody that's a an essential worker works in hospitals or or emt or anything like that we've opened up a few models where we give you uh very close to like employee pricing basically on it so they can get on our website and access that too for anybody that's uh kind of out on that forefront fighting this stuff right now. So, Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any, uh, what's lined up for the future or at least this year, anything we could expect uh, new from all? Uh, yeah. So like I said, it's been pretty busy. We launched the, the 30 day money back guarantee and opened it up on everything, uh, every one of our products. So whatever Walter you have, you buy it, you don't like it, send it back to us and we cut you a check for your full, full refund plus tax. So, um, you know, you know, we we started out just on a PPQ series, and it, it barely got any back, so that was awesome. And then opened up PPS, expecting to get a lot back, since that's a, a, a lot more massively sold gun at a, at a better price point, and barely got any of those back. So we wanted to open it up to everything. So even if you do buy PPKS and you, you don't like it in that thirty days, we you can send it back to us. We'll find a new home for it. So. Um, so that was uh, that's been going on right now, but we do have a, a like I said a lot of new products coming uh, for for later on in the year and beginning of 2021. Um, as we kind of work through the summertime, it's normally a, a slow month, as you know, working in retail for for firearms uh, and for for gun shops and, and firearms manufacturers. So uh, it kind of gives us a time to prepare for all those launches. But uh, yeah, we have a a lot of new a lot of new guns coming out. Can't tell you too much, but uh, they probably. They'd probably come in here and kick me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would say keep keep an eye out later on this year because we've got some very new flagship style, just revolutionary products coming that we're super excited about. So not not just a new uh, color line extension. So <laughs> very cool, very cool. Caleb, you have any uh, any other questions or anything you want to put out there? No, sir. I mean, this has been absolutely phenomenal. I've enjoyed every second, Cody. I really do appreciate your time, brother. Yeah, no problem, man. Like I said it's just uh, my job ain't, ain't too hard when I get to talk about guns and, and James Bond, so it's uh, <laughs> not that difficult for me. I enjoy this stuff. All right, so let's go around the room before we uh, do our goodbyes. Our final thoughts on the 2020 Walther PPK in 3 days. Jay, want to kick it off? Sure. I mean, I would be lying if I said the second I picked it up and went to rebox it to send it over to Ray, my hair didn't stand on end. I mean, we talked about the presentation box pretty aggressively earlier on, but really the the style and everything built around this gun complemented it perfectly. I think, you know, I I have the Smith model and I've never once carried it in the box it came in for the exact reason Cody was saying. It just doesn't fit the gun. When I go to the range or whatever, I have like a, one of your guys' bags that you guys produce that's just almost like a laptop sleeve with the wall of branding on it. And I just, I, I don't see the appeal to it. And so when you see a presentation box like that, that does have that utility where you can just grab it, toss it in a bag, utilize it, use it for presentation, what have you. I mean, that's phenomenal. I really love the, the black melanite finish. Um, I think it's a really great addition. You know, when you look at the PPK throughout its history, there were so many minute changes to it for specific people or specific branches of military, whatever it may have been. And I think this is another one of those exceptional adjustments 
dedicated exclusively to the concealed carry market. You know, it, it's designed when you are carrying on the appendix where, you know, my Smith about once every three weeks, I have to oil it down to make sure I'm not rusting it out because it's carrying against the body, especially in the summer months when things get pretty warm. So, I mean, I, I am absolutely thrilled by everything you guys have done for it. And I'm really, really glad to see it back on the market. Well, I, I appreciate all the, all the kind words. It, it's, it's tough sometimes around here because a lot of times at the manufacturer standpoint, you hear a lot of the negatives all the time. Like, oh, you should have done this. I wish you would have done that. So uh, we hear that quite a bit. So it's nice to hear some of the changes that we made and, and some of the work that these guys are and, and girls are putting in here is, uh, is paying off out there and people are actually liking it. Um, the PPK, PPKS is very near and dear to our heart, uh, especially when you, you look at a lot of us too. We're, we're, we're pretty young around here at the office. Um, a lot of our leadership and, and, and what we what we all push, we're all modern day, you know, tactical law enforcement, competitive shooters and things like that. But like I said, there's a there's a place in our heart for the, the PPKS. And uh, I think it is, it just goes back on it's one of the most iconic guns ever. And I always tell people like, there's there's a couple of guns you need to have in your safe if, if you're a gun guy. And, you know, 1911, if you're, you know, an American, you better have a 1911 in the safe. And, and two, you better have a, a PPK or PPKS in there. Like those are this is iconic guns in history that, you know, like, you could be very appreciative of and they're still very efficient in modern day and still go out and shoot them, have fun. And, uh, always, I hear so many cool stories when I'm out there because, you know, it, everyone thinks that they are rare and I, I get this like concentrated dose of them because I hear so many people like their dads brought or grandpa's back, uh, brought back PBK, PBKS is from the war and passed it on down to them and stuff. And, and last year, or two years ago at SHOT Show, I actually brought in an artist to do uh, a piece live at our booth, and he did a uh, kind of like this older hand that's a little bit more wrinkled with a PBKS in it, and it was passing it down to a younger-looking hand. And I thought that really explained what that gun is. Um, the gun I carry every day, this PBQ, is probably not a gun, right? I'm going to pass down to my, my children or, or any of that, but the PPKS is something. It, like I said, it's that iconic where it's once you buy it, you do want to pass it down to your kids. It is it is that important, you know. So um, I would say definitely get out there and, and give it a try and uh, give yourself that uh, James Bond feeling. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree more. Um, having shot it and everything, I think it's it's fantastic. It's reliable. I put two hundred some odd rounds through the first day of the range. All different manufacturers. Not a single fail to fire, um, nothing. It fed properly. It was accurate. It was comfortable to shoot. It gives you that aesthetic. Uh, the new 2020 model is just like the perfect amalgamation of a pre-war and a post-war with some modern features as well. It looks fantastic. And like you said, this is something that, uh, that I would definitely hand down to my kids. It's not going anywhere for sure. Um, yeah, if, uh, if you can get your hands on them when they you know, start becoming more prevalent and available at uh, your local shops, definitely pick one up. Absolutely. Um, I recommend it for sure. <laughs> There's really nothing negative uh, I had to say about it. It was fantastic. Fun to shoot. Awesome. Yeah. And always uh, keep a lookout on a lot of our advertising. I try to sneak in some uh, some Bond stuff in there about it with some of the uh, the video advertising and our new catalog. There's a few uh, James Bond shout outs in there that uh, only real Bond fans will notice. So. <laughs> oh, very cool. Very cool. Love to hear that. Look forward to finding those. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're cool. Most of that stuff is all owned by me. So <laughs> I make sure to toss them in there just to give the shout out to the big Bond fans. So Very cool. Well, Caleb, <clears throat> uh, any uh, last thoughts, anything you want to put out there? No, sir. Like I said, uh, huge thanks to Cody. And, you know, thank you again to Kyle. I'm just going to plug him one more time. He, <laughs> I wouldn't have it if it wasn't for him. So, <laughs> I mean. Honestly, a guy worked day and night to make sure we can make this a reality. So it was very, very kind. I'm very thankful, for sure. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so Caleb and Cody, thank you both very much for uh, helping me out with this video. I uh, love the input. Um, thanks for watching. Make sure you follow uh, Caleb on his Instagram, commando.bond.007 on Instagram. And Cody, if they want to follow you, it's one.cody on Instagram. Yes, sir. Really cool shots at the range. Uh, you were rocking a scar the other day. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like I said I'm constantly trying to get get a little better, but uh, 
There's P99 A or M2. That was pretty cool. I, I kind of skimmed through lightly and saw that the, throwing them inside the, the guts there. That was pretty cool. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. The combo. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't believe it all fit into the frame as perfectly as it did. So that was awesome. Oh, I think Cody froze again. <laughs> That's a perfect pause face, though. That was a big old smile. smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to stop on that. I'm going to stop the recording. So thank you guys for joining me once again. Follow Caleb, follow Cody. This is the Bond Army, and I will see you next time.